April 24, 1943. Back in January, Jewish resistance fighters achieved the unimaginable. They defeated the SS murder squads and drove them out of the Warsaw Ghetto. Since then, they and over 50,000 ghetto inhabitants have held the ghetto, well aware that they have only bought time, but also that every day they are delivering a kick in the guts to the Nazis' murderous pride. This week, the SS returns. This is War Against Humanity, a series of World War II in real time. I'm Spartacus Olson. This is the first weekly episode of War Against Humanity. As both atrocities and resistance has risen over the past months, our bi-weekly episodes have gone too long and unwieldy. By shifting to a weekly coverage, we aim to continue providing our detailed, unvarnished documentation of the War Against Humanity at an episode length that is a bit easier to digest. So from now on, I will be seeing you every week. Thank you for watching, despite how hard it is, and thanks to the Time Ghost Army for being part of the creation of what is already now the most exhaustive documentary of the transgressions of World War II ever created. In early April, we saw how Bulgaria, Romania, and Hungary stepped on the brakes when ordered to hand over their Jewish citizens. The Belgian town of Martzel was mistakenly bombed by Allied bomber crews, and details of the Soviet mass murder of Polish officers at Katyn are now spreading across the world. A famine is brewing in the Indian province of Bengal, while the Henan famine is slowly but surely coming to an end doesn't end is the endless shower of bombs that continues to be dropped on European cities on a daily basis. On April 15, the RAF raids Stuttgart, killing 619 people, including 257 French and 143 Russian POW. On the 17th of April, 327 aircraft raid the Skoda armament factory at Pilsen. None of the planes managed to hit the factory but a large asylum building is struck, leading to an unknown number of civilian casualties. On the same night, 271 aircraft raid Mannheim, destroying 130 buildings and damaging 3,000 more. Close to 7,000 people are homeless, 269 are injured and 130 killed. On the 20th, German Führer Adolf Hitler quietly spends his 54th birthday at the Berghof in the Alps. The RAF delivers a deadly present to Berlin and two other cities, with a main raid being conducted against the city of Stettin. 339 aircraft deliver their load of explosives and incendiary bombs. Approximately 100 acres of the city center are destroyed and 586 people are killed. The Germans retaliate. A day later, on April 21st, the Germans retaliate by raiding the Scottish city of Aberdeen. Incendiary explosives and cluster bombs destroy a large part of the city center, damage close to 10,000 houses and kill 27 servicemen and 98 civilians. In each of these raids, enemy aircraft are shot down and some aircrew members survive to be captured. On both sides, despite the terror they have inflicted on civilians, they are in most cases treated humanely as POWs under the Geneva Convention. In Japan, the story is a different one. After the Doolittle raid last year, the Japanese launched a massive manhunt for the US air crews and carried out a retaliation campaign against the Chinese harboring them which cost hundreds of thousands of lives. Some of the Doolittle raid aircrews were murdered by execution in October last year. Aircrews captured on the battlefield have at least survived, but then have to languish in the inhumane Japanese POW camps. Now, another event in the air will escalate the situation again. On April 18th, Japanese Admiral Izuruku Yamamoto, the commander-in-chief of the attack on Pearl Harbor and the Battle of Midway, is killed by the U.S. Army Air Force by shooting down his plane. The Japanese and American public won't learn of this event for another month. The Japanese will stay silent because they anticipate a blow to morale and want to control the story, and the Americans as they don't want to give away any hints about their code-cracking abilities. Yet on April 22nd, the Japanese broadcast a warning to you as airmen should they be captured by the Japanese, saying, By the way, don't forget, America, make sure that every flyer that comes here has a special pass to hell, and rest assured, it's strictly a one-way ticket. 
In Europe, a similar fate befalls those who are caught resisting the Nazis and their ideology. On April 19, a second trial of White Rose resistance members takes place in Munich. After the executions of Sophie and Hans Scholl and Christoph Probst in February, the Gestapo has now also captured most of the other White Rose Corps members, including Alexander Schmorell and Willy Graf. They and several others are sentenced to death. Once again, the crime is spreading anti-Nazi leaflets. Despite these examples, a few people are still willing to risk everything to resist the Nazi terror. As we have seen, until now the fate of the Jews deported into the East has not resulted in a marked increase in resistance, but now that their fate is a matter of public record, acts to help Jewish countrymen are on the rise. Even brazen acts of daring do rescue attempts. On the same day as the White Rose trials, a train leaves Mechelen in northern Belgium. It's the 20th transport from Belgium headed for the Auschwitz concentration camp and extermination factory. Packed in cattle wagons are 1,631 Jews. The wagons are sealed from the outside and almost impossible to escape without external help. Help that now arrives. Near Brussels, three Belgian resistance members, Robert Maestrau, Jean Franklemon, and Jewish doctor Jura Lichwitz, have covered an ordinary lantern with red paper. Thinking it's a stop sign, the train conductor slams the brakes. In the chaos, the Belgian fighters, armed with only one revolver, cut open one of the transport wagons, allowing 17 Jews to flee. They are given a bit of pocket money and make their way into the city. The resistance hand remaining Jews saws and files in the wagons to use themselves. As the train continues its journey to the east, they manage to open some of the wagons, allowing 219 more people to jump the train. Of them, 91 are recaptured and put on the next train. 25 are killed during their escape, but 120 succeed and disappear into the countryside. Remaining 1,412 men, women, children, and infants will continue their transport and almost all will be murdered. That is the reality of facing off with the well-organized, heavily armed squads of paramilitary murderers inside occupied territory. You are almost certain to lose. The 50 to 70,000 Jews holding the Warsaw Ghetto since they drove out the SS in January know this far too well or as one of them puts it, the last stage of resettlement is death. They are instead determined to go down fighting. Via secret tunnels, thousands of Jews have already managed to seek refuge outside the ghetto. But it's a real challenge to find reliable and safe shelter with the local Polish population, so most stay to fight. For over three months, the Jewish combat organization said OB, led by 24-year-old Mordecai Anielewicz, has been busy constructing countless bunkers, digging trenches, and building tunnels between cellars. The secret exit tunnels are being used to smuggle in small arms, some rifles, but mainly pistols and revolvers, as well as hundreds of hand grenades, explosives to make mines, and gasoline for Molotov cocktails. Hundreds of fighters have been trained in urban warfare, a small but determined army, and when they learn that something is afoot on April 18th, they are as ready as can be. On April 19, the German commander of the SS Higher Security Police, Ferdinand von Samann Frankeneg, sends his troops towards the ghetto. He has nine officers and 821 men of the Waffen-SS Panzergrenadier Regiment. There are 234 more order police and 330 Soviet citizen auxiliary troops. They are further supported by field artillery, three armored vehicles, and a few dozen heavy machine guns. They enter the ghetto from the north and establish a foothold at the intersection of Mila and the Zamenhof Street. Here, they are attacked by Jewish fighters from all directions who unleash a hailstorm of bullets and a rain of grenades. A panzer vehicle rushes to the rescue, but is hit by a Jewish Molotov cocktail. After an hour of fighting, the Nazis retreat. The German forces are also halted at the intersection of Nalevki and Gizia, where fighting goes on for six hours before they retreat there too. Other attacks are repulsed at the Jewish headquarters at the Muranowski Square, where a Polish and a Star of David flag are waving defiantly above the Warsaw skyline. Jewish commander Anielewicz writes that the Jewish attack had surpassed our wildest dreams. The Germans ran away from the ghetto twice. The Polish Home Army writes about immeasurably strong and determined armed resistance. 
When the news reaches Nazi Reich's propaganda minister Josef Goebbels in Berlin, he notes in his diary, I gathered that a truly grotesque situation is gripping Warsaw. When such conditions prevail in an occupied city, it certainly can't be said to be pacified. It is high time that we evacuate the Jews just as quickly as possible from the Generalgouvernement. On the second day of the battle, which is dubbed the Jewish-German War by the Polish Home Army, Commander Saman Frankenegg is replaced by Jürgen Strop. Reichsführer SS Heinrich Himmler calls him at once, furiously shouting at him to take down those Polish and Jewish flags at any cost. Strop launches a second offensive and manages to take control of the Muranowski headquarters, and the flags are removed. Despite this advance, skirmishes continue for the rest of the week. Outnumbered and outgunned, the Jews have settled to hold out for as long as possible using urban guerrilla tactics. From fortified positions moving through hidden tunnels, they launch suicidal attacks denying the Nazis any perspective of a quick victory. By the end of the week, Strop patience is running low. In his written report about the uprising, he explains that, after only a few days, I realized that the original plan had no prospect of success unless the armament factories and the other enterprises of military importance distributed throughout the ghetto were dissolved. I cannot imagine a greater chaos than in the ghetto of Warsaw. The Jews had control of everything from the chemical substances used in manufacturing, explosives, to clothing and equipment for the armed forces. The managers knew so little of their own shops that the Jews were in a position to produce inside these shops arms of every kind, especially hand grenades, Molotov cocktails, and the like. Moreover, the Jews had succeeded in fortifying some of these factories as centers of resistance. On the 23rd, Strop orders to literally burn down the ghetto. Block by block, cellars and buildings are set ablaze by flamethrowers. Jews are forced to flee their positions, with one stating that we wanted to get killed by shooting rather than by burning. Over the next days, the Germans will burn during the day and the Jews will regroup and reinforce at night. They're holding out, but at staggering costs. Several thousand Jews are already captive. Anyone carrying arms is killed on the spot, as are all Jews that are considered incapable of forced labor. The patients of the Gezia Street Hospital, including the ill, wounded, pregnant women, women who have just given birth, and their babies, are murdered. Jewish commander Anielewicz writes to a friend on the 23rd that it is impossible to describe the conditions under which the Jews of the ghetto are now living. Only a few will be able to hold out. The remainder will die sooner or later. Their fate is decided. In almost all the hiding places in which thousands are concealing themselves, it is not possible to light a candle for lack of air. Anielewicz's ultimate goal is not to live. It is to not go down without a fight, to set an example. And at that, they have already succeeded. By April 22nd, as they fight, they are already making headlines on the front pages. On the 21st, a Polish clandestine radio broadcast calling for help goes out, is captured by the Associated Press, and spread across the world. The ghetto fighters may be outnumbered, outarmed, and doomed to die, but by their heroism, they are ringing out a call to battle against their Nazi murderers. The fact that we are remembered beyond the ghetto walls encourages us in our struggle. The dream of my life has risen to become fact. Self-defense in the ghetto will have been a reality. Jewish armed resistance and revenge are facts. I have been a witness to the magnificent, heroic fighting of Jewish men in battle. Never forget. Thank you.